The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Daniel Fusco Ministries. Check this out from today's edition of Real with Daniel Fusco. For the people of God, because we live in a world full of divisions, we've also seen the divisions creep its way into the church. And it's always been that way because the church is full of people. Just as I'm growing in my understanding of who God is as I'm on this journey, when I take my last breath and and I no longer see through a glass dimly, but I see face to face, at that point, I'm going to know way more about God than I know right now. You know the Spirit is at work when people are working to try and take what is divided and bring it back together again. Today, we're going to be bringing this series to a close, and we are going to see a concept, this concept of blessings through, and and we want to be able to see our lives through the lens of the blessings that God has for us. So in order to get at this, I want you to open up your Bibles to Psalm number 133, Psalm 133, as we be, take our first of the two Psalms, we take Psalm 133 and 134 today, but we'll start in Psalm number 133, and it's amazing how simple yet needed what we're going to talk about today is. Look what it says, verse 1. It says, behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. So the first blessing we want to talk about here is simply the blessing of unity. The blessing of unity. Because it begins, behold how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. And then it begins to unpack different word pictures to see what this unity is and how does it look. But notice that one of the blessings God gives is the blessing of unity and the unity amongst the people of God. How good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. But guess what? We live in a world that is marked by division. For the people of God, because we live in a world full of divisions, we've also seen the divisions creep its way into the church. And it's always been that way because the church is full of people. And so, you know, it's not like the, we have more church division today than they did 2,000 years ago because you read the book of Acts and almost immediately when non-Jewish people begin to put their faith and trust in Jesus, when the Gentiles start saying yes to Jesus, the church starts to have issues, right? As the apostle Paul is traveling all throughout the Gentile world, there are people going at them they go, oh, Paul's not telling you the whole story. You have to really become Jewish to become a Christian, you know? And, and the early church by Acts chapter 15, they're having the Jerusalem council to settle what was an area of division in the church. Every one of the letters to a church is actually designed to deal with some of the divisions that were happening in the people of God. Now, why does division happen? Because people are involved and flesh, the flesh divides. But really what we learn here is that when a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus, that how good and pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. So because I know that the flesh divides, I always have to remember grace brings together. See, my flesh divided me from a relationship with God, but God's grace as it overcomes my sinfulness, now I get to have a union with God. I get to be at unity with God. So God's grace overcomes my flesh's division. And in the same way, when believers allow the grace of God to override their fleshliness, then unity happens. But we live in a day and age now where we really see our society cannibalizing. It's eating itself alive. And we see the same thing going on in the church today. Now, here's what I want to tell you. You have no control over what anybody else does except what you do. You have no control over what anybody else does, but you have control over what you do. And here's what I want to tell you. You and I, as part of the Crossroads family, because we believe in Jesus, we should always work for unity. Because unity is a blessing. 
How good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. So we should make it our goal to seek after unity as opposed to division at every turn. Now, I am not saying that we should, that we should have unity at all costs. Because sometimes in the name of unity, we begin to uh, uh, not let the Bible be the Bible. Not let the word of God. So I'm not saying that we should always be unified no matter what. The ideal is not unity at all costs. The ideal is Jesus at the center, God's grace. And then we realize that there is unity in diversity. If God desires his people to be unified, are you right now proactively working for unity or are you undermining unity? That's the big question. For you, are you proactively either working towards unity Or are you proactively undermining unity? Because how good and how pleasant it is for the brethren to dwell together in unity. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, in these verses, you really see what fights against unity, what fights against it. The opposite, of course, is uh, lowliness, is pride. The opposite of gentleness, of course, is is arrogance or or abrasiveness. The opposite of uh, long-suffering is impatient. The, uh, The opposite of bearing with one another is trying to get rid of one another. And so all of these things are ways that we actively undermine unity if we're proud, if we're, if we're aggressive, if we're not patient with people, if we're, not, if we're, if we're willing to discard people if we disagree with them. And, and, but if we choose lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, all like Jesus, we bear with one another just the way Jesus bears with us, then we can endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And this blessing of unity is so profound that it's actually... The psalmist used an analogy to point to what it looks like. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down the beard, the beard of Aaron running down the edge of his garments. So the first picture is that when the brethren dwell together in unity, it's as precious as the precious anointing oil that was only used to set apart the high priest. Like that, they're saying unity in the brethren is so precious that it's like this oil that was only used when the high priest was set apart and he was anointed. And of course, that oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is at work in the heart of a person, they are not dividing, but they're seeking, how do I bring people together again? So I believe that we can always see when the Spirit of God is at work because we know the Spirit of God's job is to take what is Jesus and declare it to people. So the Spirit's job is to unite sinners with Jesus, with their Savior, with the Lord. And in the same way, on, on, the, on the horizontal level with us and other people, you know that the Spirit is at work when people are working to try and take what is divided and bring it back together again. Do you hear what I'm saying? I mean, this is what the psalm is saying, that unity in the people of God is as precious as the oil that was only used to anoint the new high priest. It was set apart for a specific purpose. That's a precious oil. Unity is precious in the eyes of the Lord. What else is this unity like? Notice this, and we we might not think anything of this here in the Pacific Northwest. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, live life forevermore. Now it's a picture of dew. Now I know for us, we live in the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest. Pastor Bill Ritchie, our our founding pastor here at Crosses, when he invited me up, you know, we had been living, I was from New Jersey, but me and uh, my bride have been living in California where my bride was from. And he's like, listen, after you've been here for about 15 years, 15 years, you'll end up getting webbed feet. You'll be fine with the rain. So the idea for us of like the dew of Hermon, you're like, what's, what's the big deal about some dew? We get 100 straight days of rain in the winter. What's going on with this? But listen, in Israel, it's, it's, it's a desert climate. It's an arid climate. And so in the midst of the summer months, Mount Hermon was the highest mountain there in Israel. And it was known for all the dew that would settle on at night. And in a, in a, in a dry climate, that dew is, is important because it moisturizes the land. And in the same way, that's how God sees unity. 
And he wants us as his kids to seek after unity with other believers. Does that mean you're going to agree with everybody on every point of doctrine? No. But if you agree on the big things, then we can choose as a family to discuss the other things and not demonize one another. One of the blessings of being part of the children of God is that there's diversity within the children of God. And as long as the big things are the same, Jesus, the Bible, God's purposes and plans for humanity, who God is, as long as those things are there, I, can, I, I realize all of us are going to get a theology upgrade when we take our last breath. No matter how much, and I study the Bible every day, and I want to teach, my own, and I want to go deeper in it, but I realize just as I'm growing in my understanding of who God is as I'm on this journey, when I take my last breath and, and I no longer see through a glass dimly, but I see face to face, at that point, I'm going to know way more about God than I know right now. And I'm going to get a theology upgrade. And so are you. So because of that, let's work for unity. And if you don't think that this is important to Jesus, you have to remember, Jesus actually prayed that the church would be unified. You don't believe me? John chapter 17 Verses 22 and 23 says it this way. And the glory which you gave me, Jesus is speaking, I have given to them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Do you see what he's saying? That, that I want them to be one just as, just as Jesus is God in human form, God in Jesus, Jesus in us, he wants us together to, to, to have that, that unity, that oneness. And that's why, of course, we, we need to esteem others higher than ourselves. We need to be patient with one another because none of us are perfect. But where grace exists, there is the blessing of unity. And I believe that within the unity and diversity, because of the finished work of Jesus, of the church, we, there's so much that we can learn. One of the things I love so much about the people of God is that I learn from people who are older than me and younger than me. I learn from people who've been walking with Jesus longer than me and I learn from people who've been walking with Jesus less time than I have, right? There are every nationality, all these different things. There's so much diversity and we're all on a different step of our faith journey. But when we let God's grace cover all of that stuff, we get to walk in this preciousness and this blessing. When we're a part of a family, we need to make sure we devote our energy. Lord, how do I be an agent of unity? Like Jesus, in the midst of all these things that are going on. So the first blessing, of course, here is, is the blessing of unity. Now, as we move to Psalm 134, the last of these songs of ascent. And it, I, I love that this is the, the song. It's only three verses, but this is the last psalm that they would recite on these three pilgrim feasts. Look at what it says. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. So we're going to talk about blessings. My friends, you and I, we need to bless the Lord. Like where we praise God, where we declare the goodness of God. And on this journey of life, whether it's a good day or a bad day, whether it's something that we wanted or something we didn't want, whether things go the way we hoped that they would or the, completely the opposite, we need to learn how to bless the Lord in the midst of it. And we learn a lot about the heart or the, un, the characteristics of the people who bless the Lord. Notice first, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. You know, you see through the lens of the Holy Spirit, you see that unity is important. And you say, oh, I'm a servant of God. That like I have breath in my lungs because God has given it to me. I, there's these gifts and talents that I have and that I've been able to cultivate because God has entrusted them to me. And God wants me not to use them for myself, but to use them for him. And so when you choose to serve the Lord, then obviously you'll bless the Lord because you're seeing your whole life and all that you are through the lens of the Lord. And so God wants us to, to be his servants because ultimately we are. In him we live and move and have our being. And the person who blesses the Lord, who's a servant of the Lord, who will stand by night in the house of the Lord. So when you're a servant of the Lord, you want to be in the midst of the people of God. Now, imagine this. In these pilgrim feasts, 
everybody would be going to the temple. They'd be going to the tabernacle. And they're not just there for like, man, gosh, I hope the, the priest goes fast and I hope the worship isn't too long. They want to be there. They're in the family house. They're excited about being there. And one of the ways God is blessed when we take our place as a fully engaged family member, it's one of the things that blows me away so much about our Crossroads family. And not only the Crossroads family that gathers together here in our campus in Vancouver, but for so many people who are joining us online, people who are picking us up on the radio, on television, they're picking us up on social media, that people are like, hey, how can I get involved? How can I be a part of this thing called church? Because they're like, listen, not only do I want to receive, but I want to be a part of it. God wants to use me and I want to step into it. I'm always so excited when I see somebody who gets excited about who the Lord is and what he's doing. And they're not just like, man, I'm in and I'm out. But they're like, no, I'm in and I'm going to hang out for a while. Do you ever have those situations where you meet somebody and you, and you figure, oh yeah, we're just going to hang out for a little bit. But then you hang out for hours and you're like, where'd the time go? Right? I remember before we had kids, I was able to do that a lot more because, you know, when you have kids, you have to run around and make sure, you know, the kids fall apart at a certain time. But, you know, it was amazing. I remember when, when my bride, Lynn, and I, when we first met, and, you know, we, we were supposed to just spend a little time together. We ended up spending like five hours together. I'm like, and it felt like five seconds because you know it's where you want to be, where you're supposed to be. And the idea of the servants of the Lord, they, they want to be in the house of God. They want to see what God is up to. They want to be about their father's business. And not only that, they lift their hands in the sanctuary. Now, you know, I realize everybody worships differently, you know. But it's one of the reasons why at Crossroads people lift their hands. Because, you know, when you lift your hands, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of two things. One, it's a sign of surrender, right? It's like when someone lifts their hands. But it's also a sign of joy and comfort. Like when you go into a, a child's room and they're in their crib, when they see their parents, they always go like this. Saying like, hey, pick me up, mom. Pick me up, pops. Right? And in, in that way, it's, it's a beautiful thing when someone can raise their hands in the sanctuary and they're saying, Lord, we praise you. We lift up our hands to you. We are submitted to you. We are surrendered to you. We are rejoicing in you, right? If you've ever been to a sporting event and you're, something amazing happens, everybody's hands go up. It's, it's a sign of great joy. And so I remember when I first started going to a church like Crossroads, when I first started walking with Jesus, and I remember walking in the sanctuary and, and people had their hands raised and I thought, what is up with those people? But one of the ways we bless the Lord is by making much of him, engaging ourselves in worship. This is why it says this in Psalm number uh, 96, verses uh, 7 to 10. It says it this way. Give to the Lord... O families of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth and say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Oh, I love that. You know, we're, 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 we worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Not our own holiness. We worship the Lord in the holiness of Jesus that has been given to us. We bring him an offering. Not only do we give him financial, you know, and, and our time and our talent, but we also, we also bring an offering of praise to the Lord. Like, like it's a sacrifice of praise. When you choose to stop and say, God, you are so good. And when we're singing together as a church family, you know, it was an amazing thing when I stopped just watching, watching the lyrics of the song and said, I'm actually going to try and worship God. And before you know it, it's like, I love worshiping the Lord. Why? Because he's worthy of praise. Right? We, we tremble before him. We realize we stand before the Lord. And so, so not only is one of the blessings of this journey is when God gives us that lens to see that we should work proactively to be unified with other people. Unity in diversity. Not unity at all costs. But we also, one of the blessings is that we bless the Lord. We worship God. We make much of him. And I want to encourage you, as a, as a church family, we want this place to be on fire with worship. And I'm not talking about like, you know, a bunch of emotional Sometimes we have a lot of that in this day and age where, where people like, they're like shouting and crying. And all. Like, listen, some people are emotional and that's how they're going to worship. Some people are, are, are more stoic. But as long as your heart is inclined to the Lord and you're praising him, that's what we want. We want the people of God to make much of the Lord because it's one of the lenses through which we see the, the world in which we live in. And then notice how this psalm closes. Verse three, it says, the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. And I would say it this way, brothers and sisters, we need to let the Lord 
bless us. You need to let the Lord bless you. Because not only do we have the blessings of unity, and we choose to bless the Lord, but the Lord is also desiring to bless us. And one of the things that has blown my mind the most as I've walked with Jesus for 20 years is God's capacity to bring blessings upon his kids. You know, there's an old saying that I've heard that you can't outgive God. I've learned that to be true because I, I want to bless others. And God's like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see, I'm going to see your blessing and I'm going to raise it by a lot. God, as we say, God, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to try and bless others. God's like, well, listen, I'm going to bless your socks off. Jesus said, you're more blessed to give than receive. And I want to encourage you to live your life in such a way that God's blessings can rest upon your life. Because he desires to bless his people. All through the scriptures, the Lord's desire to bless people exists. Don't miss the fact. I mean, you read the, the, the creation account of Genesis chapter 1 and, and 2. Everything that God made, God says it's good. It's good. It's good. You know, and then he makes Adam on the, on the sixth day. And he says, it's very good. But then he notices it's not good that Adam is alone. So God blesses him with Eve, you know, and, and, and all of these things. All the way through, God's purpose is to bless people. But God's blessing only happens when people honor the Lord. And we find in the life of the children of Israel that although God desired to bless the children of Israel, if they rejected him, they were going to experience the fallout from rejecting him, which we see as curses. And so we want to live in such a way that the Lord can bless us. It's like what it says in Psalm 67, verses 1 to 4. It says, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah, that your way may be known on earth your salvation among all nations. Let the people praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations of the earth. When I started reading Psalm 67, here at Crosses, you know that, that idea of the Lord God be merciful to us and bless us. Cause your face to shine upon us. We, we recite it as the benediction at the end of every gathering. That, that the priestly breast blessing of, of Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you. But in Psalm 67, it's Lord bless us. So, so the people are real. As the priests would have prayed this blessing, as we pray this blessing over one another in the benediction, now in Psalm 67, it's like, Lord, will you bless us and keep us? Will, will, will your smile shine upon us? Why do we want that? Verse 2, that your way may be known on earth and your salvation among the nations. When God blesses us, God's way becomes known on earth and, and salvation is among all the nations. And when that happens, what happens? Then the people praise God. Let all the peoples praise you. And all the nations are glad and they have joy because you know that God is judged, but you know his blessings because you know his son Jesus. So my friends, listen, as we bring this The Way Up series to a close, as we bring this time and this message to a close, listen, when you are a child of God and when you see life through the lens of the Holy Spirit, there are blessings that abound. Where you end up in relationship with people, you don't agree with everything, but you love them even despite your differences. You don't need to line up on everything to appreciate who they are because God has humbled you and God has chosen, called you to be patient. He's worked patience in your life and he's, because God has bared with you with all the crazy parts of your life, you bear with other people. And so you endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And because of that, you've just blessed the Lord. You're like, Lord, you are good. I want to worship you, God. And as you worship God, then you're like, Lord, I also want the blessings of your presence in my life. And when that happens, now all of a sudden our life is full of blessings because no matter what happens, God is still infinitely worthy to be praised. My friends, the way up is all about a life of praising God, blessing God, choosing to bless other people, even if you don't think that they deserve it, because that's exactly what God has done for us. So I want us, as we journey through this pilgrimage of life, just like the children of Israel would do these pilgrim feasts back to Jerusalem, as we journey on the pilgrimage of life, let's let our life be a life where we're blessing the Lord. We're walking in those blessings and we're choosing to bless other people. And when that happens, amazing things happen. The Bible says unequivocally that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that's not the end of the story. Not that we fail but that Jesus came on a rescue mission. 
to save anybody who would believe. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter where you've been. And I realize that there are many of you who are watching right now, you have never before put your faith and trust in Jesus. I'm here to tell you, Jesus desires to save you. That's why he came. That's why he lived perfectly. And that's why he died on the cross for your sins. And he didn't only die on the cross for your sins, but he rose from the dead, conquering sin, death, and all of our shame. And Jesus wants to give salvation to you as a gift because of his grace. So if you're watching this right now, and you've never before said yes to Jesus, and you're saying, I want to receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior right here, right now. Will you pray a little prayer with me? Bow your head in your heart as we pray together. Say, Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for saving me. I believe in you, your life, your death on the cross, and your resurrection. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lead me and teach me to follow you. And I ask it in Jesus' name. We all said together, amen. If you just said yes to Jesus, you made the best decision ever. And as you begin your journey with Jesus, I want to get some resources in your hands to help you on that journey. But I need to know that you said yes to Jesus. So do me a favor, pull out your mobile phone, text the word SAVED to 51400. That info is on your screen. When you do that, someone from my team will get in touch with you. And then we want to get some resources in the mail to you to help you on this journey. But listen, don't go anywhere. I have a big idea that I definitely want to share with you. You can take part in the amazing work God is doing through the powerful message that although life is messy, Jesus is real. By partnering with Daniel Fusco Ministries, you help make programs like this available to people who may not otherwise experience the love and hope only found in Jesus. With your regularly scheduled partnership, your generosity can help transform lives forever. Go to danielfusco.com slash partner now and become a part of the Daniel Fusco Ministry support team with your regularly scheduled or one-time gift. Be the hands and feet of Jesus in your world and become a partner today. Hey everybody, Daniel Fusco here. Welcome to today's Two Minute Message. No matter where you are, start your weekdays with an encouraging thought from Pastor Daniel. You'll find his popular Two Minute Messages on Facebook, or you can subscribe to them on YouTube so you don't miss any of them. Each weekday, Pastor Daniel brings insight and encouragement on important topics that affect your life in only two minutes or less. Join the community now. Go online and search for Daniel Fusco on Facebook or Pastor Daniel Fusco on YouTube. If you're looking for a church family in the Vancouver area, we invite you to check out Crossroads Community Church. We are a family of faith, fully engaged, transforming our community and our world and we would love for you to be a part of what God is doing through the Crossroads family. Our main campus is in Vancouver, Washington. For service times and directions, visit crossroadschurch.net. Well, even though we're almost out of time on today's program, I wanna help you grow during the week. Make sure you go visit my website. It's danielfusco.com. There's so many resources there for you. Don't forget, sign up for our weekly newsletter. It gives you insights and stories of how God is transforming people's lives. And please pray with me and partner with me, helping to get this message that Jesus is real out to more and more people. Click the partner tab on the website to find out more. I love social media and we have content on all the different platforms. So find me on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, on Instagram. Look out for podcasts and sermons. They're all out there. And I want to help you keep taking steps with Jesus as we're all in process, simply responding to him. Okay, here's today's big idea. And it's simple, but powerful. Embrace what you do understand and trust in the goodness of God for all the things that you don't. Okay, I gotta go, but never forget, although life is messy, Jesus is real. And he loves us even in the midst of our messy lives. God bless you. I'll see you real soon.